I'm Andy. I'm going to talk about first culture and ethics. Um, I think officially this is the second time I've given this presentation. I gave it out at the uh, first mentor conference this past this past uh, August in in um, San Francisco, San Jose area. So who are who are the veterans in the room? Who, how many how many veterans? This is like your second or third season. Okay, I see you. I see hands. So who are the who are the new people, new rookies and such? Okay, that's fine. Hey, welcome. That's that's cool. Um, so I'm going to use a, uh, a a slide. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to get it started here. And actually, hang on. Hang on. Let me let me share my screen. So you can see what my slide is. Okay, do you see this first ethics and culture? Is that, you guys see that? Yes? I can't see you, so, oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> all right, um, good. So uh, first of all, who am I? I'm, I'm a husband and a father, first of all. That's my wife on the left, my three daughters. They, they all have been pivotal. And first, all my three daughters um, were first students, were first leaders, and, I, and they're still first volunteers now that they're out of high school. And my youngest is a senior at Purdue. My old, older two are out in the workforce, making us proud. Um, and I, re I really tr truly believe that FIRST is a great place for a diverse group of students and adults to, to mix. Um, I'll get to that later. Uh, I'm first mentor and volunteer. I've been a mentor since 1998, and I'm president of Andy Mark, and I was the 2003 Championship Woody Flowers Award winner. But really, I, with this slide, I really can't do what I'm doing without the support of those four women there. So before we get into culture and mission or culture and ethics of first and some of the details um we veterans we we well i think this this has actually been updated like within the past week and i didn't update my slide so check out the the new first mission and vision they've 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 changed some of their wording of this they've made it a little more streamlined um i was kind of surprised by that and i've been busy this week so i didn't update my slide but that's, that's some news so check out first first um, website for their updated mission. But we as veterans should should often go to the website to see what's up, look at their, study their core values. I think, um, I know FLL does a great job with regard to getting the kids to talk about core values, discovery, innovation, impact, inclusion, teamwork, and fun. Um, Grace's professionalism and cooperation are, are key terms that we use often within FIRST. And then um, more than robots is, a, is something they've been using a lot lately, last five, 10 years, that robot, that first is more than just robotics. So my, my point here is as we lead, uh, as we lead new first members on our teams and maybe new teams and for the job of us veterans is to make sure people know where they can go get more information about this information, firstinspires.org, hide that. And then um, we can talk about this throughout the year. And this this will kind of be our some of our, our, our North Star direction that we can follow as we deal with culture and ethics. So the founders of FIRST, it's important to know, um, Dean Kamen is the founder. He is the primary founder. He's an inventor. He really is the... the impetus behind our inspiration. He inspires many of us. He gives us homework assignments at events. He, um, he connects people together. Um, he, 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 with some help, he invented or he founded first in 1989 um, and it became a competition in 1992. Um, he's an excellent fundraiser. He gets big companies come in and give first funds. And right now he still, he leads DECA, which is a huge research. Well, it's pretty, Pretty big research organization. They have like I don't know, maybe like 800 engineers working on development um, projects for different various customers, and they're based in Manchester, New Hampshire, right near where First is based. 
and on their headquarters. Dr. Murphy, Dr. Murphy is, I, I consider him a co-founder. He helped Dean found first. He's an inventor. Um, uh, the origin, I, I have an origin story with Dean. Um, so Dr. Murphy is an older gentleman. He actually recently turned 100 years old. And then two days ago, he passed away. So rest in peace, Dr. Murphy. Um, yeah, two days ago. So here's to you, Dr. Murphy. Uh, but the story goes that um, Dr. Murphy and Dean were working on a project in New York City when this is like in the, in the 80s. And... Dr. Murphy's dad, um, Dr. William Murphy Sr., uh, won a Nobel Prize for the development, I think, of vitamin B. And um, that helped out people's health. It made us, you know, helped out the, 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 the vitamin business industry, and it helped people become healthier. And so he, got a, he received a Nobel Prize. And so he was telling Dean about this, and Dean's like, well, where, where is this prize? Where, did, where is the prize? Where is the, the medal? And he said, well, it's in a closet somewhere. It's up, it's up on a shelf. He said, well, that's a shame. People, people should know about your father's Nobel Prize. People, kids, kids should know about who these monumental role models are in, for science and technology and um, writing and health and all this stuff. And kids, kids should emulate heroes who are making the world a better place instead of emulating heroes that hit balls with sticks or put ba basketballs through hoops. We should do something about that. So they started thinking and they um, went along and they found Woody Flowers, who also passed away recently in 2019, but he was running a class at MIT called, um, I, don't, I actually don't know what the name of it was, but 2.007, they renamed it. And the challenge of that class was to take a kit of parts and um, follow the rules of a new game every year and compete against other students in the MIT class. Sound familiar? So it was it was a robotics competition. It was not so much team based, but it was it was individual based, and they would have a new challenge every year. And Dr. Murphy and Dean thought that was pretty cool, so they they rolled. They, they recruited Woody to be a part of this new thing called called FIRST, and here we go. So the beginning of FIRST was really founded by Dean with the help of Dr. Murphy and Dr. Flowers. Woody is considered the father of competitive robotics because of what he did at MIT. He coined the terms cooperation and gracious professionalism. And if you go on YouTube and look around, you can find a lot of stuff on Woody. Um, there's, there's Recently, there were some really good videos that were called the good stuff videos. And um, I would recommend looking up those. I'm, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna try to show you one here soon if the audio visual works correctly. Um, gracious professionalism is a key mantra term for us to use within FIRST. And it's, can, in my opinion, um, it's competing in the, the, the hardest and the most passionate way you can while still being gracious to your competitors. So you might, you might help them out as they get ready for the, for the match, or you might go see how they're doing if something broke after the match. But you are still gracious, even though you're trying to win against them during a competition. Um, so Dr. Murphy, because he liked Woody's communication skills so well, he created the Woody Flowers Award in and, and, um, 1996. He gave Woody the first Woody Flowers Award. So if you ever wonder, if you ever ask, well, who's the first Woody Flowers Award winner? Well, it was Woody. Um, there are 28 championship Woody Flowers Award winners. There's 1,042 Woody Flowers finalist award winners. Those are those are given at district events, regional events, and the winner the winners are really supposed to emulate Woody's spirit, and they act. Our group of championship Woody Flowers Award winners we act as advisors to first, and then. Um, we act as strong community leaders. I'm sure you have strong community leaders in your areas that are the, the Woody Flowers Award winners and the Woody Flowers Finalist Award winners. And um, they're, supposed, they're supposed to be like the, the champions for team ethics. So 
who cares about this stuff? Culture and ethics. Who cares? All right. I would hope. I don't see you right now, but I would hope that you care. <laughs> um, so CARES is an acronym I'm going to use. Um, I'm going to talk about culture, accountability, rules, ethics, and support. Culture. Okay, first has changed a lot over the 30 years it's been around. Um, and initially, what happened was companies were challenged in 1992, or actually 91, to form teams to compete in 92. So Dean and his colleagues went out and asked companies, Xerox, GM, Ford, Johnson & Johnson, and also universities, um, MIT, um, WPI, other, other universities to form teams and go, go get some high school kids to be on your team. And we're gonna give you a challenge of uh, this robotic game and you're going to compete. So the first year there were 28 teams. Um, from 1992 to 1998, it was it was a one-on-one -on -one competition. Every team was for themselves. You went to a match. All you wanted to do was beat the other team in that match. Um, there were judges. There were pits, just like there are now. But seriously, in 1998, that was my first year. In 1998, I vividly remember in our pit. There'd be kids working on the robot, adults working around the robot, or helping the kids, whatever. And um, if someone come up, if someone came up to our pit, they would um, they would ask how a robot works, what does it do during the match. We we were not incentivized at all to um, to to tell them what that robot did. We we uh, we kept secrets. And we didn't tell competitors what a robot did because there were there were not alliances back then. The only people that we told really everything were the judges. So the judges got the whole spiel. The other teams really had no business or there wasn't any incentive for us to tell other teams how we played the game, what we did in the match, what our best attributes were, what our drivetrain was, all, all that stuff. So in, in 1999, first, actually at kickoff, it was quite impactful. We, we already paid our money. We registered in September, October. We go to kickoff in 1999, and they say, uh, things are going to change. Every single match you're going to be in, you're going to be par partnered with another robot. So you have to depend on this other robot to play this game of first. And most of us were kind of mad about that. We were like, what? We paid our money, and now we have to depend on this other team we have no control over to win the match? That's kooky. That's crazy. So we don't want to do that. But then by the end of the year, kids were collaborating. They were opening up. They were they were sharing each other's designs. Teams were um, saying, here's where our best attributes are during these matches. Teams were marketing to each other. It was magical. It was amazing. And within those two or three months of between January and March, that change was the biggest, I think, the biggest impactful thing that ever happened in first, the onset of alliances in 1999. Um, it went from less communicative, more secretive, less likely to help others, to we were excited to talk about the robots. We, were, um, we, we had a strong desire to help other teams compete at the top of their game. Um, then it got even, even more crazy when we went from two, two versus two to three versus three in 2005. So that was an exciting time also. But the Alliance onset in 99 was a big, huge deal. Accountability. Um, so team accountability, individual accountability, supplier accountability, part of our culture, part of our, part of our world within FIRST is um, for us to get along, for us to cooperate, and for us to have gracious professionalism is to be, to be accountable. Um, I've seen teams be accountable for things they do bad. I've seen, I've seen teams not be accountable for things that they, they do bad. And it takes sometimes years for them to recover from that. Um, teams, like whenever I would be a, a field coach, if I'm a field coach with my drivers, um, I know that everybody's watching us and I have to make sure if, we, if something goes sideways during the match and such, there's frustration. Um, it's, it's not good. We always 
save the frustration or save the um, the passion about what went wrong and such for a private moment, not in front of the whole arena. You don't you're not you don't yell at your driver or yell at either. well you shouldn't do that anyway. But you shouldn't really be debating and pointing and be expressing yourselves loudly until you really get away from where people can't see you. So be careful regarding um, your frustration after matches. Let things cool down and then go through the issues as a, as a team privately. Um, there's been there's been time there was a time um, there was a team back in uh, gosh the middle 2000s we we would run we would run IRI so IRI is a off season event held in Indiana and it's it got to be to be popular enough it was an invite only event and people would apply to come compete and then we me and some other guys oh, Chris Fultz, Jeff Smith, me, we would decide who are on, who is actually on the invite list. So if we have 120 applicants, we would have maybe 60 or 70 invites. That means that 50 or so teams are not happy, but they didn't get invited to IRI. So there was a team at one point that would come every year and they were a very, very successful team. But every year, without fail, they would be complaining about stuff. They'd be saying, we don't like this. We don't like that. And they were just they were just kind of jerks about how how the event would go or how you know that's not how it is where they're from. And they were just like, you know, you know what? You don't have to come. It's like, gosh, guys, this is an off season event. So there was an there was another year where they were one of those teams that wasn't quite as good as they were, and they they didn't get invited, and that was frustrating to them. We talked about it afterwards. I talked about it afterwards. I was like, hey, if you guys come every year and you're just complaining about it, why should we invite you when there's other teams that want to come in? So they eventually were accountable for their actions. Um, we held them accountable. It was kind of tough, but um, that was a way for a team to kind of learn a lesson over the years. And we, we had to talk it through with them and get them to um, – be a better team and be a more positive team. And now they're, they're still good friends and they, they're, they're good people in the community. Another, some examples of individual accountability. I, I've seen like, um, I, have, I have a good story. Uh, ooh, shoot, shoot, sorry. I remember having a, a student a couple years ago that uh, we were out of, we were out of stock of a part and shame on us, we actually accepted an order for that part that was out of stock because I think they got their order in right at the end of when the stock was available at Andy Mark. And um, we, we let them know that, hey, this, this isn't going to be able to ship for a couple of weeks. It was in the middle of build season and they were, they were darn frustrated. So I had a student email me and they said, well, this is, this is inappropriate. You should do a better job of of managing your inventory. Um, this is, you shouldn't take the order if you don't have it in the stock. He's right, he's right, he's right. But they said, you're, this is a big bait and switch and you stole my money, you're a thief. I'm like, whoa, I'm a thief? Well, I don't like, that. that's that's a low blow. That's kind of fighting words there. So I um, I was writing an email back to him. I'm, I'm gonna TPQ a lesson, blah, 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 blah. And I'm, I'm typing this email and I pulled in some fellow staff members and they read my email and said, don't send that email. You got to tone it down. Andy, you're still a mentor on these teams. You got to back off your, your hot head right now and you need to take a break. Don't send the email yet. Just because he called you a thief, you don't need to rip the kid. So I, 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 I actually changed the email and I said, okay, I'm going to ignore the whole thief thing. And, and actually his, his teacher was copied on the, on the note. So I copied the, I had the teacher on my note back to him and I said, I'm going to ignore the, 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 the thief thing, but yes, I'm going to address all these issues. Here's why it was out of stock. I'm sorry about that. This and that. And I, I was, it was a, it was a well-written letter after my, my co my colleagues got me off the ledge there. Um, the teacher emailed me back and said, Oh my gosh, I did not expect that kid to send this email. I'm so sorry. He didn't check with me before he sent the email, um, but it's all good. 
it's it's fine. He said that the, the, the he said the kid is, you know, he's he's really passionate about these things, and he's he's sorry, but he, you know, he just went too far. So that year at Champs, I'm walking through the pits. That that teacher grabs me, and I end up able to talk to the kid. We get a picture together. We're smiling. We're laughing. Water under the bridge. Bridge. No big deal. I'm actually in a. I really appreciate the teacher and the student both for for wanting to say hi to me at Champs. And um, you know, I was the, the student was accountable for his actions. The teacher was accountable for the student's action. Um, I had. You know some good people to help make sure I didn't make a mistake when I fired back at the kid, and it was a good example of accountability uh, with regard to individual actions. Supplier accountability. Um, we, gosh, we 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 make mistakes often. Um, we we do a lot here at Andy Mark, and I always say the people that don't ever make mistakes are the people that don't do much. And if we do a lot, then it's hard to bat a thousand. So. We do make some mistakes. I think when we react to customer feedback, um, we want to be very accountable. Um, I, I think also if if there's something that goes goes wrong with maybe our product with a supplier or some interaction between those suppliers, that's that gets difficult sometimes. There's been some times when we have a hard some of our supplier to supplier relations are difficult, but usually time does heal those wounds and we talk it through and we do have a positive interaction with suppliers. Um, there's, there's, a, there could be a lot of stories with that. I'm not going to get into the details of that, but I think, I think what I want to say there is in our community, the suppliers who, who support first the best are the ones who really are accountable for their actions and they're accountable in the end to the students and the teams who really want to use their products. So, I'll say if, if there's anything that you want from us that you think we did wrong, um, uh, we could, you can always send an email to customer support or cust customer service at andymark.com, or you can call us and say, hey, what's up with this? This is I think this is wrong. And we can talk about it. Often, often also a lesson there is if we see something that went wrong and we're, we're catching it first and it's not seen out in the market yet, this is just basic business one-on-one. If, if you tell your customers that something's wrong before they noticed what it is, they will be much more forgiving to you as opposed to them coming to you with the problem and saying, hey, your product has this issue. And um, you, you always come out shining brighter if you are proactive about the issue and accountable ahead of time to the customer before they know about it. Okay, rules. It's it's hard to be accountable. It's hard to get people to to be aware of things if they don't know the rules. And not everybody knows the rules exactly the same. Not everybody has the same exact interpretation of the rules. But when they when your mentors and your veterans tell you to read the manual, then you need to read the read, read the manual. And it's not just the robot robot manual, but it's um, like YPP rules. Every team should have a very strong mentor student um, like contact relation rule. Um, that's been a, a heightened focus this year uh, for student safety. You should all this, every team should have a safety protocol with regard to mentors like, you know, too deep mentoring, that, those types of rules with, with regard to how teams are ran. That's, it's not just about robot rules. This is also how teams operate themselves. Um, there's also event rules, like from from safety in the pits to seat saving in the in the stands, which you shouldn't do. You need to you need to know these rules. Make sure you communicate these rules, um, not only for to be safe, but also to just to be gracious to your competitors at the event. Um, that's part of our culture is, is following these. These are these are our rules, and we need to follow them. Um, volunteers have rules. Mentors, suppliers, um, they all have rules and roles that they serve to support first, but really the the end, the focus should be making sure the teams have a great experience. Um, one, uh, so for many years, I was a head ref. This is me being a head ref in Oklahoma City in 2008. That was a great 
fun group there. Um, and one of the advice, piece of advice that, that not only Woody Flowers, but also first management would tell me is like, like when, when you're, when you're working through a rule issue with a team and you're trying to be as fair, consistent as you can, there's always, there's, there's always an instance where there's, there's, it's not quite black and white and you got to do your best to make the right judgment. And the advice I got from Woody was that if you're in that spot, always side on the betterment of the team. Now, if it's black and white and the team needs to be disqualified, yeah, you got to disqualify them because that's fair to the rest of the teams. But if, if there's something that is really a nuance that's it's hard to understand exactly what the final rule is, please side on the team's um, um, on the team side that you're ruling against. Um, when you when you make those types of rules. It, it, as a maybe as a lead robot inspector or an FTA or a head referee, you got to include the students in your rule discussion. Um, if you're the volunteer, if you're the if you're a mentor, you got to work through those rule discussions with your team. And I would recommend strongly you don't just blame people for rules to be bro broken. I would expect those teams who get disqualified or have issues at that come at them. Please use these as a learning experience, not as a um, a chance to pile on against against volunteers. Okay, ethics. Now let's. I might need some verbal feedback here, but let's see if this um, video works. Okay, hopefully you guys heard that. That was good. Yes, was that good? Did you hear it? Ah, shoot. Okay, so maybe at the end we can try to do that again. Well, okay, so it's on YouTube. Woody Flowers, Good Stuff, Ethics. I would, that's, that's my search. Um, suggestion for that. But what he was talking about was uh, we as teams need to really decide where we stand on some ethical issues. So my slide here says, okay, clearly it's bad to steal. If you're at an event, there's a, there's a laptop in your neighbor's pit. It's, it's bad to steal a laptop. It's, it's bad to steal another team's award entry like verbiage or their video or whatever it's obviously bad to sabotage the radios at the duluth regional or where, whatever event you're going to um it's 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 bad to disable somebody else's robot um it's there is a path for reporting bad issues in your mind and there's a non-medical incident report like uh, event managers event like people that run the events they help students and teams 
um, file reports for people that are inappropriate or situations that are inappropriate. And um, sometimes those are subjective and not as bad as others, but uh, there's been uh, many years, there's been sadly just bad things that have happened because our community is pretty darn big. We, we wanna minimize those things as much as we can, but they still do happen. Um, my advice in that area is act quickly report it to event management and address the issue that day, that time with the person that, that did the thing that was wrong. Like if there's a student, this happened in Indiana three or four years ago, there's a student that's writing um, um, abusive things on flyers that are on the wall, then that day that student needs to figure out that that was not right. It, it's better off to handle it as soon as possible. But these are clearly bad. These these things that you know, pretty obvious. The thing that gets harder with your team is um, some of the thing some of the things teams think are perfectly fine, and other teams think are not perfectly fine. Some examples: um, seeking. Some teams really, really, really. I mean, they they are notorious and they are famous for seeking out the loopholes within the game. Um, the, every year they come up with a really novel idea or, or um, a unique solution to the game. And other teams might think that's, that, that's borderline cheating. That like, well, why are you always trying to lawyer the rules? Or why, why are you trying to look for a way not to play the game that first wants us to play? That's, that's not gracious professionals. So everybody thinks a little bit differently with regard to some of these subjects. Um, the use of other other uh, robot designs or parts of other teams, um, especially like, like a, if you don't give them credit or ask permission, like if you're using somebody else's uh, design that you saw, maybe you, you saw a, a, um, someone use it successfully, I would recommend that if you use someone else's design, I would give them credit for it. It's a hot topic or debate to have a student or an adult drive coach. Some teams are passionate about not having adults behind the glass coaching the students. Um, other teams, they think it's a good opportunity for the adult to, to mentor not only the students on their teams, but be a positive mentor to students on other teams. That is a decision your team has to make. That's your own team's ethics and, and decision of what's great for your, great for your team. Um, like some teams are so popular Another example would be some teams are so popular that they have like 200 students apply to be on the team. So that means you have to cut away team, you have to wait, you have to actually cut students and not allow every single student be on their team. So is that gracious to not let every kid be on a team? For some teams, that's fine. Other teams, that's not fine. So these are these are ethically thing ethics that are more gray and not as black and white. Um, like another. Another topic that's kind of a hot topic would be just, just adult involvement on the team. Some teams believe the adults really shouldn't be turning wrench or fixing things on the robot or even designing things or coding things. It should all be students. Um, other teams believe this is a mentor program and the students need to see what the mentors do professionally. So seeing the mentors design, seeing them fix things and program things is a good, is a good part of first. And that is, um, that's a debate that still happens, and every team needs to figure out where they are on that scale of, of um, you know, of gray between this is great or this is bad. Support. Um, we as a community are, I think every year we get more supportive of each other. There's, there's more, there's lots of different types of people in FIRST. We have a lot of folks in FIRST from older folks, younger folks, uh, different races, different um, economic backgrounds, different different sexual orientations, different religions. Um, I think like, like, I cannot imagine what's happening like in Israel right now with regard to diverse teams in Israel. So there are, there's Jewish teams and there's Arab teams in Israel that are all on first and they, uh, I'm hoping somehow they can make it through a season and they can have events and it's going to be a challenge for them. And they're, 
it's going to be hard for them to sometimes be in the same in the same room or the same event together. And that'll be difficult because there's a there's a war going on. It's just really hard. That's kind of an extreme case, but that's part of our world, sadly. Um, I think as we talk about support, um, I think any time you're working on anything with the new robot the, or your robotics team from fundraising to the robot itself to programming to CAD design or whatever, leadership, the more you empower the students, the more you, you support the students, no matter, no matter their age, their, their ethnic background, their ability, the more you support them, the, more, the, more, the better off you're going to be. And I think along that way, um, if you respect diversity and empower students who are minorities, I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, as we as we relate to each other within our community, um, there's a lot of cross team collaboration. I always tell our our students to um, as we go to an event try to talk to students on other teams, try to talk to adults on other teams, and they're going to give you support also. Um, you might, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot that happens amongst teams that collaborate together, like, like, like taking multiple teams on the same bus to go to championships or multiple teams having the same workspace and competition field or doing outreach events together or hosting off season events together. You don't see, at least I don't see sports teams doing that as much as robotics teams. I think robotics teams, part of our culture is the fact that we support each other, even though we compete against each other. Um, sometimes there's even coaches and mentors on multiple teams. They're supporting multiple teams and that's a, that's a great thing. So the culture of support within first is strong and we need to keep that going. Um, so some actions, some homework actions, uh, just to kind of review. Culture, know your basics, propagate our culture by sharing your stories. Um, you older folks, older students, older mentors, please share your stories like I was sharing some old stories. And hold each other accountable. Um, you got, you got to still have respect for each other, but if you see somebody veering off of something and not doing something that's, that they should be doing, tap them on the shoulder and hold them accountable for what they're doing. Read your rules, understand your rules, not just about the robot, but your team, your tournament, the game rules, all that stuff. And then have the exercise of deciding on your team ethics. How is your team structured? How, is, how do you run your team? How much are your students empowered? Who's the drive coach? All that stuff. And then continue to help each other and support each other in our community and it's going to continue to be great. Um, so I, I got some time. Thank you for letting me do this. I think we can talk about some stuff if we want. Let me stop sharing. Um, you got any questions about anything I talked about? You guys are quiet. Maybe it's early, it's early up there. Yes, in the back. Could you, could someone repeat that? I think I think the main thing that the, the the term gracious professionalism is a really genius term. It's it includes respect for each other as we're gracious toward each other. Um, professionalism means we're not we're 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 kind of we're not lazy. We're not we're not slackers. We're not unprofessional and we're competing in a manner that is gracious with with our team and against other teams so i think gracious professional gracious professionalism kind of slurred there i think if you lean on that one as the most important part of our culture I, i'll go with that good question
Uh, that's a great question. Um, it's hard. Yeah, we try to. Um, we've had we've had our challenges. We've we've had uh, we've had some really difficult challenges this year. We've had a. I think I think um, when Mark and I started the company back in 2004, we started out of our garages, and it was really hard. But it was him and me and his wife Emily and my wife Mary and those four people. We knew each other pretty well, and um, it's easy back then to deal with ethics and culture because it's just you four people. So once we started hiring people, we're like, oh shoot, we gotta we gotta somehow do a mind meld and and get our opinions into these other people and our culture into these other people. And so we, we, we actually, I think it was 2008 or 2009, we created our own mission and our own goals for a company. And we, we talk about those a lot. But even so, there's people that, that sometimes do things that surprise us. Granted, 99% of the people that have worked here have been fabulous and they, they do wonderful things and they really are a great example of our culture, first culture. Um, and we try to emulate what FIRST is doing. So yes, 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 we try to emulate and we try to follow the FIRST culture within Andy Mark. Yeah, go ahead in the front. How do we, how do we make sure students are holding themselves accountable? Um, if we have a contact with a student as a company, so I'll, I'll answer it in two ways, as a, as a coach on a team and as a company. Um, as a company and as a coach, whenever I'm talking to a student um, through email or electronic means, I always have another mentor or another adult on the email. And usually I, if it's, if, if it's anybody on my team or anybody on a team that we're dealing with as a company, I try to include that that teacher or that mentor, that key mentor, so they they see the conversation that's going on. So if a student does something that I see that's wrong, um, as a as a not a teacher, I try to include the teacher with that communication first of all, and then um, teachers are more educated and well equipped to handle issues with students than I am as a, even as a 28 year men, member or mentor. So get the teacher's advice, get the teacher involved, get the, the school staff member involved. If it's not a school organization, then get leaders of that organization involved with the student. Um, have it, make sure when you're addressing the issue, it's not just you and the student, there needs to be at least a third person in the room. So it's not just a he said, she said type of thing. And even though you're you're trying to get the student to do some to, to be accountable for something, you that they did, I assume they did something wrong, right? Um, and you even though they did something wrong, it doesn't mean they're a bad person. You have to make sure that you you maintain a level of respect and gracious professionalism toward that student. It's hard. Sometimes that's hard, but try not to pass judgment that they're a bad person, even though they did something that was wasn't the best. So they separate the action from the person. But yeah, include a teacher or leadership of the team. Have more than just you and the person talk about the issue. Have three people talk about it. Um, address the issue. Don't think the person's bad just because the, the issue was bad. Yeah, in the back with the hat. I, how do I confront people who are not being gracious? Um, first thing I might do is have them repeat what they just said or what they, if they're, if they're being, let's say they, they're being disrespectful for a to a teammate or to someone out often to disarm them, you have them repeat what they just said. Like, hey, that was a that was a racist joke. Uh, you're thinking to yourself, that was a racist joke. Um, maybe you can say, hey, could you could you repeat that? I'm not quite sure what you said said. 
and if they say it again, then you're darn well sure that they meant what they said. If they if they take it back and they say, well, uh, and, you know, they might they might not say it again if they know it's the wrong thing to say, and then they're kind of becoming accountable already. But um, I would have them repeat what they just said. I I wouldn't initially admonish them in front of everybody. I would try to pull them aside, probably with a teacher or with someone else, and pull them aside and say, hey, Johnny, what's going on? Um, this isn't good. You just told us all to f off or something like that. That's not a pro that's that actually happened to me a couple of years, two years ago. One of our one of our students didn't like something, told us all told us all off, and was mad at the whole team. And so we pulled him aside and said, "Hey, you can't do this. Well, do what?" And he he wasn't accountable at all for what he said. He said, "Well." I, I blacked out and I said, no, you didn't. You said this, you had to be accountable for this. Doesn't mean you're a terrible person, but why you can't do these things. So just like I said, try to try to take the issue away from the person. Maybe have them, have them repeat what they said just to make sure it's clear, pull them aside, pull them aside and try to correct them. Don't, you don't have to, you don't have to beat them down in front of everybody. Um, that's hard not to do sometimes. But I always try to correct privately and praise publicly. So if someone does something really well, praise them in front of everybody. But if they don't do something very well, try to pull them aside and correct them. And uh, you, student, you student leaders, you're going to have to do those things too. It's not cool as a student leader to call out um, a, a, another student and embarrass them in front of the whole team if they did something wrong. You might have to just pull them aside and said, hey, Susie, you, you didn't get this done. You said you were supposed to get this done. Why, why not? It's better to do that privately than it is um, in, front of the, in front of the rest of your team. Unless it's repeated. Yeah, it, there's a time and a place for, for um, the more public um, correction, but definitely not the first time. What else you got? So my request is go find Woody's Good Stuff Ethics video on YouTube. So check it out. If you, if you don't know Woody, sadly he passed away maybe before many of you got involved on the team, but he's really brilliant. And I would recommend searching his old videos.